You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. If you like sex and violence, evil brunettes, and angelic blondes, then stick with us as we debate some of the best and worst of action and exploitation filmmaking. What's going on, you motherfucker? Welcome to Extreme Cinema. I'm David Lawler, and I'm joined by Andrew Legank. As usual, how are you, Andrew? I'm doing great. How are you? I, just, I think I said too much. Could be better. <laughs> My a... urine has a funny smell. I think I drank too much. <sighs> That's disgusting. My pee smells strange, but thanks for asking. Tonight, uh, we're talking about the the uh, films of uh, John Frankenheimer. What would you little maniacs like to do first? A uh, celebrated director of uh, television early on and then got into films later after that. And two movies, a personal favorite of mine and a personal favorite of Andrew's. A personal favorite of mine is The Manchurian Candidate and a personal favorite of Andrew's, which would be 52 Pickup, produced by uh, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. For yeah, Canada. the Cannon Brothers. And uh, Manchurian Candidate being produced by Frank Sinatra and Frank Sinatra's production company for United Artists. Mm. I, I don't know where to start with Frankenheimer, except that I remember he did he directed some episodes of television uh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, I believe he directed things like that, and then he kind of just he went on into films. Manchurian Candidate being one of his first. What we have here is that uh, actually, strangely enough, yesterday mm. was John Frankenheimer's birthday. Ah. He was born February. Um, I'm sorry, it's January. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, his birthday is February 19th, which is actually, I guess, I'll premiere the episode on that day to commemorate his birthday. Sweet, let's do it. It's awesome. Which which will be a Monday. So I'll have to do it February 18th. So we'll assume that it's February 18th today right now. But he, he was born February 19th, 1930. And uh, in Queens, New York, where where I am now. He was he's, he's Queens boy. Well, goddamn. Same as our president. Fuck you, David. And uh, he's no longer with us. He passed away July 6th, 2002. Yeah, yeah, he died. Yeah, he died back in 02 from complications after spinal surgery. In addition to The Man Turing Candidate in 1962, he also directed Birdman of Alcatraz, which I remember. Yes. Very good movie. I believe that was Burt Lancaster. Yes. And uh, uh, after Man Turing Candidate, he directed Seven Days in May, which is a very kind of Man Turing Candidate. It's another Man Turing Candidate and, and movie. He, it's a conspiracy about the military taking over the government. And we did Friedkin, uh, um, who did French Connection 1, and Frank and Frank directed yeah. French Connection 2. That's right, yeah. Um, and he also did Black Sunday. Um, Black Sunday, Which yeah. is and, a Thomas Harris novel, you know, before uh, Cannibal Lecter. And, uh, I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Kind of doing, he was doing action movies before they became popular. Yeah, and they 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 weren't really actiony. You know, they were they were they were different. They were like you know, it, it's uh, it, he, he always had an interesting take on on these kinds of movies. But yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah. And it, you were Seconds you were noted was another really interesting film of his. That's the one with Rock Hudson, right? Zony one. It was very uh, very interesting. That was Rock Hudson, wasn't it? Yeah, that, right? Rock Hudson, and it's, and it's I do, totally I, a Twilight Zone movie. It wasn't. It wasn't. I'm actually looking at it now because I thought I recalled it being written by uh, uh, Serling, but it's not. It's no, no. Actually, Seven Days in May was written by Serling. Oh, okay. Louis John Carlino wrote Seconds. It's kind of a yeah. weird science fiction. Yes, it is very similar to a couple of episodes of The Twilight Zone about a mm. fountain of youth and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then he did he did some work for HBO where he directed some very good movies, actually. And Against the Wall, The Attica Story, he directed that. Oh, he yeah. directed The Burning Season with Raul Julia. Andersonville for, I believe, TBS or TNT about the Civil War. A very Kate, brutal movie. The Island of Dr. Moreau. Holy shit! Yes, the island of Dr. Moreau with uh, Val Kilmer and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> a very funny story about that, about uh, taking over the production of that, and he couldn't stand Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer was absolutely out of his mind. He, he was working with Brando, too. Val him. Kilmer. <laughs> yeah. He wrote, he said that uh, he refused to discuss the film and that no. Will Rogers never met Val Kilmer. Yeah. <laughs> and then he directed Ronan, which uh, I had problems with watching it. It, it was a lot of trademark action and all that kind of stuff, and it had a good cast. Robert De Niro, Jean Reno, really 
just uh, it wasn't that great of a movie. I didn't think it was that great either. I, I'd watch it again now, though, because I, I always appreciate it. It was a very European movie. It, it's strangely, and, and you know, that, that's that's a common thread in a lot, not all of, but in a lot of Frankenheimer's movies. Is the European intrigue story was something that he liked a lot. Yeah, and, and would and would make you know. And then, but then he could get very American. He'd get a dear um, uh, fifty-two pickup, dead bang, which is like you know, hundred percent American. And, you know, there was always, the, 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 you know, definitely some political, political, he was always looking to make a little bit of a political statement, but not quite as overt as we do political statements these days. Yeah, that's true. His, probably his most powerful political statements were Manchurian Candidate yeah. and Seven Days in May. Hey. Oh, he also directed The Holcroft Covenant, which I remember, that's what was, that was a Robert Ludlum book. And, and he did the George Wallace TV movie, which I haven't seen. He did but, the George Wallace TV yeah, movie. You, too, look, yeah. you look in his, uh, in his uh, CV here, you see you see a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of political political movies but but he never he never goes over the line of uh of really like he he sort of nudges aside he doesn't he doesn't overtly take a side and uh now do you remember reindeer games starring ben affleck yeah it was a pile of crap don't waste my motherfucking time okay that was the 2000 that was in 2000. That was his last movie in the theaters. I don't feel bad saying that because I really wanted to like that movie a lot. And I kept wanting to, like, the first time I watched it, I was like, like I, I was, like, dying to see it. And it sucked. Mm. Like, and then I was like, I have to go back. It's like, because, like, look, it's got this great cast. And, like, it's got John Frankenheimer. This has to be better than this. It's like Year of the Gun, which also sucked. Like, like mm-hmm. it's just like every once in a while he would just make a movie that sucked, and and that was one of them. Dead Bang is a number one of my favorites of his, though. It, it, flaws and all, and it is definitely a flawed movie um, with Don Johnson. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I love love that movie. Just in many ways, it's uh, it, it, there, there's there's a lot about it that that I've always enjoyed. What do we got? <laughs> Fifty-two red queens and me are telling you, you know what we're telling you? It's over. The links, the beautifully conditioned links are smashed. They're smashed as of now because we say so. Because we say they ought to be smashed. We're busting up the joint, we're tearing out all the wires, we're busting it up so good, all the queen's horses and all the queen's men will never put old Raymond back together again. You don't work anymore. That's an order. Anybody invites you to a game of solitaire, you tell I'm sorry, Buster. The ball game is over. We'll let's start this off with the Manchurian Candidate, which um, now... This movie was unavailable for a very long time until it finally came out. I bought it, it like, on Laserdisc. It was like 88 that like they did this whole re-release and put it on a video. Back yeah, the, the, the movie was in release for several years after it was made, but then it was pulled with uh, from circulation. Ownership rights for some, Frank Sinatra's production company. Frank Sinatra owned the rights to the movie along with another movie called Suddenly. And he pulled both movies. He didn't like he didn't put them out in the theater. And a lot of people thought that it had to do with the the uh, there were too many similarities between that those movies and the assassination of JFK and also that Urban Legend said that Lee Harvey Oswald watched that movie, both movies actually, before killing John F. Kennedy. But that really wasn't the case. It was just Sinatra not not releasing the movie to the public. Right. Because and then it was re-released in 1988 with a PG-13 rating, and that's interesting to me because the movie is uh, very graphic. It's a very brutal movie. It is. Um, and and there's a lot of stuff in there that that you wouldn't ordinarily see in a movie in 1962. So uh, that's what I was thinking might have been the reason for its being pulled. Maybe I I, I could see that it, it stay. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, like I think I think politically it, it shed some. Some interesting light on on our political system, and, and in this respect, like, especially I, these I days, the feeling that 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 Frankenheimer is definitely on the left side, but in in Manchurian Candidate, he is sort of skewering everybody. 
Yes, very much so. We he's, start. He's saying that the right, you know, that the left is no better than the that the left is a bunch of commies and the right is a bunch of commies and they're all fucking in bed. You know, basically, like, like I think you know what I don't think it's necessarily communism. It's control. Yeah. It's about controlling people. Well, yeah. That, that, well, no. Well, that's that's the problem. Anyway. I, I, there the, is no I, ideology at work here except for greed and power and lust for power. Well, that's 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 the truth. That's the that's that's what happens when you when you get beyond the surface of politics and get down into the meat of it. It's uh, you know it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat or commie or or fascist. What what matters is are you corrupt or are you not? And like, like everybody is corrupt. That's the mm. problem. Like you know nobody nobody. Who's not corrupt su subscribes to the 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 ideas of fascism and communism. The, like yeah. fascism and communism are tools of the corrupt. There there is nobody out there, you know. And like like that's the funny thing, you know. Like it's like the thing now. Everybody thinks that there's Nazis everywhere around every corner because yes, yes. Not elected. And it's like and the, the the truth is nobody identifies with that shit. There there might be look. There's five people somewhere that do. Okay, but they're they're not a force in political um, activism really anywhere. Like like nobody really identifies with this stuff. And when you get down to it, at the end of the day, if you are fighting um, for communism versus fascism, no matter which side you're on, you've lost the battle already. Well, I you know it's funny today. I was showing uh, Brahman a video. It was. Uh... The Professor Jordan Peterson and his interview on BBC with this woman. I watched that tonight myself, as a matter of fact. The yeah, and we were talking about the nature of fascism and what fascism actually is. And he nails it. And this woman can't understand it. She can't understand that fascism, what fascism seeks to do is take identity politics and, and program people and turn them into robots so that they can fit into this as cogs into this enormous machine right. of power. And, and and that's that's what but he was trying to tell this woman. And he's tell, yeah, but but uh, like a lot of people, that goes right over their heads. It's like it, what he's also saying is that fascism and the communism, like the left, uh, and what what the left claims is the far right is the same thing. Like they're yeah. doing the same thing. It, it's 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 all identity absolutely. Politics. He says what you know. He she's like, what gives you the right to uh, <laughs> to to say something that's going to offend somebody? And he says, well, you're offending me right now. At that, I laughed out loud when she said that. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, do you, are you even here yourself? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Well, I'm, I'm very glad I put you on the spot. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that I have well, you get my, my point. Speech. You get my point. It's like, you're, you're doing what you should do, which is digging a bit to see what the hell's going on. So and that you, is what you should do. But uh, you're exercising you see, your freedom of speech to certainly risk offending me. And that's fine. I think you, more power to you as far as I'm concerned. So you haven't sat there and... I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work that out. I mean... Ha, gotcha. You have got me. You have got me. I'm trying to work that time. through in my head. Yeah, yeah. It took a while. It took a while. It did. It did. Yeah. It took a while. So, I mean, this is all you need is some kind of hate rhetoric. And it's mainly... In the movie, we see it mainly from Angela Lansbury's character, who bears a striking resemblance to somebody, and I'll give you 10 minutes to figure out who it is. But first, well, we start in Korea, 1952. We have Staff Sergeant Raymond Shaw, who's played by um, Lawrence Harvey, and he's a guy everybody hates. He raids the local brothel and gets all the soldiers out of there. They're busy getting laid or whatever else, and everybody hates him even more. And this is the closest thing we get to the truth in the movie is is what we're seeing in this opening shot before they before they're uh, they're basically abducted by uh, Manchurian agents, as it were. Mm -hmm. There's an important offensive that's lined up and th they're captured. And then we spend the remainder of the movie sifting through men's dreams to find the truth. So we're seeing we're seeing strange bits of this brainwashing experiment that's mm -hmm. going on. And yeah. it's, a it's a proof of concept for Manchurian spies determined to program these men to do heinous things. And Raymond Shaw is their linchpin because of his political contacts, right. uh, which are basically this, this idiot senator played by James Gregory, uh, uh, his stepfather, and his uh, scheming wife, Angela Lansbury, who plays his mom, who's only two years older than him, actually, in reality. <laughs> really? But she just, she just looks old, I guess. I guess. Wow. And the whole thing, the whole thing is 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 hinged on a vice presidential candidate being assassinated, so that her husband James Gregory can accept the nomination. Mm -hmm. So he comes home from war. He's a decorated hero 
this whole story is like invented for some reason. I, they program all the soldiers that are still alive after this experiment to tell to tell everybody that Raymond Shaw is a hero. Of course, you know he's a. What is the thing that they keep programming into them to say about him? They keep saying that he's the kindest, the, and nicest, and, and and best person that they've ever known. And, he's, yeah, he's the okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it's this weird thing. They suddenly step two in this weird programming way. Yeah. Can you tell us about Raymond Shaw? And then suddenly they just blurt out. Raymond Shaw is the kindest, warm, and human being I've ever known in my life, or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. The The problem is they all say it, and they all don't believe it because they know what he is. There's a really funny bit in there where I think Sinatra says, it's it's not like Raymond uh, uh, like Raymond's not likable. He's impossible to like. Right. I've never met a more repulsive man as long as, you know, and, and, and yeah. he... And he keeps having these dreams, and other people keep having these dreams about a strange uh, tea party in a hotel lobby or something. They're yeah. like in a hotel lobby. There's like a, a tea party or a flower party going I on. I love the way that's shot. The, the way that, that the way that that's done, where they film it like several times with all they the film different from, people. Yeah, from from different points of view. Yeah. The cultivation of hydrangeas was evolved from a number of varieties originally found in Japan. Allow me to introduce our American visitors. I must ask you to forgive their somewhat lackadaisical manners, but I have conditioned them or brainwashed them, which I understand is the new American word, to believe that they are waiting out a storm in the lobby of a small hotel in New Jersey where a meeting of the Ladies' Garden Club is in progress. May I present the famous Raymond Shaw. The young man you've flown 8,000 miles to this dreary spot in Manchuria to see. Raymond, pull your chair over here by me, please. I am sure you've all heard the old wives' tale, but no hypnotized subject may be forced to do that which is repellent to his moral nature, whatever that may be. Nonsense, of course. My dear Jan, as you grow older, you grow more long-winded. And we get to the point, has the man ever killed anyone? Or has he not? I apologize, my dear Dimitri. I keep forgetting that you're a young country and your attention span is limited. Tell me, Raymond, have you ever killed anyone? No, ma'am. Not even in combat? In combat? Yes, ma'am, I think so. Of course you have, Raymond. Raymond has been a crack shot since childhood. Marvelous outlet for his aggressions. May I have the bayonet, please? Not with the knife, with the hands. With the hands? Here, have him use this. Ah, da, da. Raymond, whom do you dislike the least in your group here today? Well, I guess Captain Markham, ma'am. You notice how he is always drawn to authority? Uh, that won't do, Raymond. We need the captain to get you your medal. Who else? Oh, well, I guess Ed Mavoli, ma'am. Ah, oh, that's better. Now then, Raymond, take this scarf. And strangle Ed Mavoli uh, to death. Excuse me, man. Mm -hmm. Hey, Sarge, cut it up. What? Quiet, Ed, please. Now you just sit there quietly and cooperate. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Like the black soldier? Mm -hmm. The black soldier in the group sees nothing but black women around. Right. And, and 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 everyone keeps saying yes, ma'am. And you're yeah. you're wondering why are they saying yes, ma'am, to this Asian man? They see him as a as a woman giving giving a, a flower demonstration in like a lobby of some some yeah. You know, like, they're all just sitting there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, we want to see it's him do something. It's brilliantly done. And like, and that's like it starts out like that, and it's kind of it, it's uh, it, it it's Twilight Zoney up until it starts to get bigger. Like until it, it, they get well, back to New York and it starts to get bigger and it's it's interesting the way the way uh, the way Frankenheimer slowly like starts to it seems seems he he's close in on everybody he's yeah. tight on everybody at the beginning and then he gradually pulls back into a larger larger picture as the movie goes forward and yes. by the end by the time we're at this convention we're in this big big wide world movie. You know, yes. like which yes. is, and it, it it's it, you don't you don't even really notice it until you look back at it at, from the end, and right. it's uh, it's very 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 well done, very well. It's done. you know what you 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 were calling it Twilight Zone. Yeah. I wasn't. I, I don't know if I was thinking about Twilight. I was thinking of it as like a weird dream theater. I, I saw it as yeah. as being like 
we're getting at the truth of something, but we're only getting getting it through this hazy dream. You know, it's like I it, think it, I get stuck on the Twilight Zone because because when it, when I first tried to watch Manchurian Candidate, like back in 1988, when it first came out, I was like, all right, I got to see this. Everybody says it's so great. And like I'm watching it on pan and scan TV and it's just fucking like like what the fuck is this crap this is some <laughs> crappy 50s tv show i don't want to watch this and like and i never got i never finished watching it until and i actually you know this this was my first time actually getting through it and, and i really enjoyed it it was great you know watching it uh watching it in widescreen hd you know yeah yeah um and it, it, it definitely made made a giant difference in in my perception of it at the start and and what the, what the filmmaker was trying to accomplish so many things that that pan and scan stuff just fucked up for me, you know, back in the day, you know. Well, I had well the the first time I saw it, I think I saw it on the video when it came out on video, and then I got I grabbed the laserdisc. Laserdisc was was widescreen. It was a letterbox rather. A Criterion, probably, right? No, no, it was actually. Yeah. Uh, I think it was an MGM disc. But I mean, just fantastic. It has it has a really good interview in there. It's interesting because uh, Sinatra was like a pain in the ass. He, this was his movie. Oh. He pretty much like financed the movie and produced it, yeah. and he gave himself a really nice salary for it. Uh, I believe he he earned a million dollars from the movie, where Lawrence Harvey was the second highest paid, got two hundred thousand for it, and the rest of the money was 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 eaten up by the production. But uh, Frankenheimer said Sinatra had very like specific specific uh, conditions to work he says he wants to do all his scenes all at once he wants uh, the schedule to be wrapped around that so he had to do that but the thing is sinatra in the movie i know he won the oscar he won the oscar for from here to eternity right. i think this is his best performance he is an incredible actor he has yeah he, i mean it's like no wonder i mean like how come all this shit goes back to sinatra like die hard you know and 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 dirty harry they all wanted to work with sinatra back then Right and, and and this is why because the guy has, I, I mean he's incredible he's so good. screen presence. It's just incredible. He has charisma. He has he can he can do everything, anything that you want. And and so I mean like if this is Sinatra's baby and he wanted to do it, he gets like Frankenheimer, who's kind of young, in the business at the time. You know Frankenheimer's going to do anything for him. But uh, he, he's just wonderful in the film. And everybody is good. I mean Lawrence Harvey, ooh, very chilling, very chilling. Angela Lansbury, incredible. And now I think our ten minutes is up. So who can you who can you who when you look at Angela Lansbury and James Gregory in the movie, this 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 woman and her her dumbass senator husband, who do you think of? Uh... You got a scheming, cold, visceral, intelligent, witch like woman and a country bumpkin of. A... Uh, so I'm thinking Bill and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> been decided that you will be dressed as a priest to help you get away in the pandemonium afterwards. Chun Jin will give you a two-piece Soviet Army sniper's rifle that fits nicely into a special bag. There's a spotlight booth that won't be in use. It's up under the roof on the 8th Avenue side of the garden. You will have absolutely clear protected shooting. You are to shoot the presidential nominee through the head and Johnny will rise gallantly to his feet. And lift Ben Arthur's body in his arms. And stand in front of the microphones and begin to speak. The speech is short. But it's the most rousing speech I've ever read. It's been worked on here and in Russia on and off for over eight years. I shall force someone to take the body away from him. Then Johnny will really hit those microphones and those cameras with blood all over him. Fighting off anyone who tries to help him. Defending America, even if it means his own death. Rallying a nation of television viewers into hysteria. To sweep us up into the White House with powers that will make martial law seem like anarchy. Now, this is very important. I want the nominee to be dead about two minutes after he begins his acceptance speech. Depending on his reading time under pressure. You are to hit him right at the point that he finishes the phrase, nor would I ask of any fellow American in defense of his freedom that which I would not gladly give myself. And it's no, it's, it's got to be no coincidence that when the movie was remade, it was remade again with Denzel Washington and Leif Schreiber, I believe. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. And, and I didn't see that. I, didn't see I that. did. I Unfortunately, I did. It was a really bad remake, but really? they had Meryl Streep playing that part. And she really? is decked out to look like 
Hillary Clinton in the movie. Really? Wow. Yes. It's interesting. I think Jonathan Demme directed that. I'm not sure. Ah. Not not good. It's not good because it, it, it's too far removed from from the things about what made the Manchurian Candidate special for me. The original was the Cold War atmosphere. Right. And they don't really do that for this one. This one is more about, you know, the Gulf War and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And the thing about war is you're you're more frightened of people that look like you. When you're dealing with like like let's say people out in the desert or something like that, they're going to look different than you and it's easier to put them in a box and kill them. But when they look like us, like say a communist or something like that, whatever the evil was at the moment right. that happened to look like that you, you felt that you were dealing with evil when you were dealing with something that looked like you behaved like you, but believed in a different ideology. And that's how the cold war was fueled. So, so that's, that's the, it it becomes creepier. It becomes creepier. It's like dealing with an alternate universe or something like that. That's a good point. So what do we have here? Oh yeah. Okay. So, so Shaw, he, he comes back from the war. He's all decorated. They set up this big party for him to kind of promote this thing. His mother is just this publicity whore. She's all about getting attention and promoting and everything. He gets a job with a newspaper and she reveals herself as some kind of a communist hater or something like that. And that, uh, there was one piece of dialogue I, I isolated here where he says he's not a communist. As a matter of fact, he's a Republican. It was just funny <laughs> about this guy that he's getting a job with. And anyway, he's a miserable son of a bitch because because of uh, because of uh, his relationship with his mother and this 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 really stupid guy played by James Gregory in the movie, the senator, mm -hmm. Senator yeah. Iceland, I Iceland. believe is his name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, meanwhile, um, all the other soldiers, well, they, actually, is this Sinatra is having dreams, the black soldiers having dreams. I is wish the black... that they had explored some of the other people in the group a little bit more, but I, I mean, time was an issue, but yeah, that's uh, true. they could have cut more of, uh, I, you know, I, I, like, I, cause you know, uh, the Janet Lee, uh, thing never really rang true for me i, I, I thought the janet thing, Lee to thing. Have seen more stuff with the with the with did the you other the, the other men in the group well did you think that the janet lee thing was a little bit creepy it's a little weird i, I have expected her to like have some control over over uh, over him and have it because of her ending. dialogue right because of the yeah. thing she says to him she's, yeah. she's got this they have the bizarre conversation on the train to new york yeah. right it was it was twilight zoney bizarre that was one of the things yeah yeah this is delaware I know. I was one of the original Chinese workmen who laid the track on this stretch. But, um, nonetheless, Maryland is a beautiful state. So is Ohio, for that matter. I guess so. Columbus is a tremendous football town. You in the railroad business? Not anymore. However, if you will permit me to point out, when you ask that question, you really should say, are you in the railroad line? Where's your home? I'm in the army. I'm a major. I've been in the army most of my life. We move a good deal. I was born in New Hampshire. I went to a girls' camp once on Lake Francis. It's pretty far north. What's your name? Eugenie. Pardon? I'm no kidding, I really mean it. Crazy French pronunciation and all. It's pretty. Well, thank you. I guess your friends called you Jenny. Not yet they haven't, for which I am deeply grateful. But you may call me Jenny. What do your friends call you? Rosie. Why? My full name is Eugenie Rose. Of the two names, I've always favored Rosie, because it smells of brown soap and beer. Eugenie is somehow more fragile. She yeah. behaved. I wrote in my notes that she behaves as though she's Sinatra's handler. Right. She's right. constantly eyeballing him, prompting him with non sequitur remarks. She gives him details to memorize. And I was thinking, if this does. is flirting, yeah, yeah, it would it wouldn't surprise me that like that, that, that maybe that was cut out of the movie that she was well, uh, I, a handler for him. Well, according to Janet Lee, by her own admission, she she had no idea what she was doing in the movie. Really? She was reading the script. They gave her the part. She's like, please play this part. She's looking at the part. She's like, what is this? What am I doing here? This right. is very strange. She couldn't figure it out, but she took the opportunity that she wanted to work with Sinatra and all that. 
Right. So it's like, uh, you know, they have this strange flirt. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they needed they needed another woman, of course. You always, you know, like we always say, you got to put a woman in there. Yeah. And they wanted somebody with whom that Sinatra could, could bounce ideas off of in the movie, other than the army guys. He's always bouncing ideas off the I, army guys. I would have preferred to have seen the other guys in the group who are having the nightmares, kind of trying to figure it out together. I, I, that that would have been. I, I think. I think that might that might have been a little bit more interesting, because I, I thought that all the, all the, the the scenes with Janet Lee were really kind of wasted, like uh, because they don't really extrapolate much on his real private life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he doesn't seem to have one. I mean, he's completely yeah. torn apart when he gets home from Korea. Yeah, he, he can't. He can't sleep. He can't eat. Uh, he smokes incessantly. He reads constantly. Yeah. He's got piles of books everywhere because he can't do anything. Right? Yeah, and so, so rather than rather than try and pretend that he has this relationship with this chick that doesn't ring true, it'd be better for him to just spend his time working with you know some other interesting people that are because because if you also notice, they really don't flesh out anybody else that's working with him. Yeah, I gotta I gotta agree with you. Well, I um, some of the people in the military. Mm-hmm. That he's communicating what they're talking to. Yeah, some very really great scenes actually. Uh, really, especially good. when but when they come to the solitaire not, not thing. Fleshed out characters though. It's which is weird. They're good scenes though. Well, one guy, the guy, the the black guy uh, yeah. with the glasses. I assume he's a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst or some kind of an expert of psychology. And then there's his boss. Yeah, they they want to put him on on like medical leave because he's obviously fucked up. But. Right. You know, and then he goes on medical leave, and then he comes spots disconnection with Henry Silva, who was there. Henry Silva playing some kind of a double agent or something, yes. who got them into that thing. Oh, but first, let's talk about the nightmares. Now, the reason they're nightmares is because they're having they're having Raymond Shaw do terrible things. Flash- they all of yeah, all these people are, are are drugged heavily. They're drugged heavily and brainwashed to, into believing they're in this weird flower thing or whatever's going yeah. on. And it's like take the gun. And and shoot the young man. Yeah, in the face. You know, you know, really, the Chinese government actually did do stuff like this. Um, not, not I'm sure they did. I'm sure they not, did. Not, not like not like with the kind of plot that's going on, you know, here to like you know come in and and, and activate them to assassinate people, but to, uh, to to do brainwashing like this and psychological warfare like this, they like they did stuff like this, and there's uh, there's some interesting books on it. Well, yeah, I've I've heard stories about that mm. um, extending even to the Gulf War. Yeah, that shit like this went on, and these this is really kind of like actually the story is really ahead of its time because this is a cell that's existing in our own country. Yeah, they have Shaw strangle somebody who who you know I mean they 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 they, they play these experiments like who who do you like the most in your unit and he's like you know this guy I like this guy a lot and then he goes and strangles him and he shoots another guy and we see blood and there's it's, it's real you don't see okay this is this is what's fascinating is. There's a lot of gratuitous violence, and there's blood everywhere in this movie. And uh, I just want to put this out there for anybody who's, who's interested in, in reading just a little bit more about it. But this is a very, this is a very interesting book by a guy named uh, Robert Cialdini, I believe is near Cialdini, um, C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. And uh, the book's called Influence. And it's a very, very interesting book, and it does it delves into some of the uh, the, the psychological warfare of the Chinese government um, in trying to make its point of how how you can persuade people to do things, and that's what the book is about. It's about how people use advertising and um, and oh, yes, techniques, yes, yes. It, it, other techniques, and as a matter of fact, he was with, yeah. yeah, he was one of the first people to. Uh, to describe the six principles of persuasion that Douglas right. Adams then refers to in, in his book? Uh, Scott Adams or Douglas Adams? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm Scott, sorry, Scott yeah, Adams. Exactly. Douglas Adams is the hitchhiker. Yeah, Douglas Adams, Adams is, yeah, yeah. Those yeah so long and thanks for the fish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott Adams talks about the six principles of persuasion referring back to the book. And uh, Scott Adams calls him like the guru of persuasion. Um, and uh, the the influence influence is a fantastic book. He's written a new one that I haven't read. Um, that that's also supposed to be uh, uh, quite quite awesome. That Scott Adams speaks highly of. But uh, yeah, that was that was where I got it. It's on Scott Adams' uh, persuasion reading list, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, I I've, I I read it and very much enjoyed it. And there was uh, some interesting stuff about Chinese government in there and their their uh, their persuading ways. Uh, Frank, Frank Sinatra's character hooks up with Lawrence Harvey later on. And uh, he is uh, because I believe it's the dreams. He goes back to his government 
identifies two men from photographs, which confirms the military suspicions because they had another guy in there and he identified them too. So he's basically ordered to make Shaw's problem. So he becomes Shaw's handler for the military. So he spends time with him. And then Shaw tells him a story of a lost love, the beautiful Jocelyn Jordan, played by the very beautiful Leslie Parrish. He falls in love with her, but his mother hates the Jordans because they're political rivals. Calls Josie a communist tart, which I found hilarious. Yeah. And because Robert Jordan, I believe, is a rival senator to Senator Iceland. Uh, he's kind of friendly in the way of the ACLU. But you got to remember also, this was politics back in, 19, in the 1960s, which was a lot yeah. different. Democrats and Republicans were not the same as they are today. That's, they were a that's lot true different. to an extent. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the creator of the ACLU is pretty much undeniably a communist. Um, that doesn't mean the ACLU doesn't have some, some good things that they fight for, but they, they're, you know, and back then, frankly, I agree with them a lot more than I do now, but. I mean, I, all these things change over time. Well, you know, work um, conditions were a lot different back the, then. Oh, true. Well, the and and also, you know, my my theory on this is that that whenever whenever there's any kind of advocacy group that advocates for a cause, yeah, if that cause is achieved it, or there's any progress made, then that group basically becomes more interested in its own self preservation than it does actually achieving anything for the people it claims to be speaking for it becomes it becomes and, an anonymous political entity yes and it's like an so, enormous it starts it an enormous to, machine it starts to like like look it has a financial interest in keeping things in, in pretending that there has been no progress so so if there if there's progress if their problem is solved what do they do exactly exactly like charities the charity, right. the charity yeah. organization should exist to put itself out of business, but it never does. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so, so many, so many things in in government and in and in social policy should exist to put themselves out of business. So like, let's eradicate this problem, and then we'll all go home. Yeah. Like, but they don't. They they perpetuate themselves and their their little their little group because they they live on it. They they survive on it. How how are they supposed to survive otherwise? And, right. and they, they just become all about keeping themselves going, and, and that, that's a problem. I think at the, that that kind of happened to the ACLU because uh, you know in, in in terms of like even though I think that they're. So some of their stated goals were 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 definitely leaning towards the communist uh, side, and they were subverting some things. I, I think that they were right to do some of those things. I, I think that, that, that some of that, so that was, was was most of that was very useful, and I agree with it, and I agree with the principles behind it. Now. Well, we're I don't know. You know, they, they seem to only choose leftist causes for the most part. They yeah, don't, they don't you, uh, pick up anything. You know, they don't pick up discrimination against people, you know, that, that don't fit. People, so yeah, pe paradigm. people like Robert DeMore at Google, you know, I mean. Yeah, should be... like ACLU should be all over that if they're real, you know. Yeah, they should. Yeah. Now, where Robert Jordan comes into it, and is, he has a relationship with the ACLU at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and a Angela Lasbury and her husband have spent years trying to discredit him and slander him and he's had to defend himself so they consider themselves deadly enemies uh and his mother doesn't want him spending any time with with uh with josie and um his mother has so much power and influence and a weird a weird kind of power and influence over her own son that he never sees her again until they come up with they hatch this scheme as it is revealed that uh shaw's american handler uh is his mother right and they use the game of solitaire to control him yes by basically saying why don't you pass the time by spending by playing a game of solitaire it activates something in him and then when he sees the queen of hearts he becomes extremely susceptible to their commands or anybody's commands because there's a funny scene where he's in a bar mm -hmm. and somebody happens to blurt that out at the bar and then yeah. and then says go jump in a lake and then he suddenly gets up sinatra's chasing him he goes over to central park and jumps Jumped into in a, a lake, lake. yeah <laughs> And that's when Sinatra realizes there's something a little bit screwy about all this. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, Sinatra and Harvey represent two sides of a coin. Harvey's isolated, he's stoic, he's emotionless. Sinatra is is ruined emotionally and paranoid. And it, it's it's a nice counterpoint. I like I like the two characters, and there's a fin, there's a two couple of really good scenes in there. It's, it, and also they're talking about the the mental manipulate. Well, like I said before, the black psychiatrist character is talking about how. Solitaire represents some kind of a psychological um, uh, experiment in and of right. itself. Right. And while he is giving Sinatra 
information about Solitaire, he's he's suggesting moves for him while he's playing. Right, <laughs> yeah. and then, and Which, then like they switch places, and then and then they they switch places totally. And, like like uh, then Sinatra is helping him play. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is okay. Now you you had mentioned that the that this movie and Fifty Two Pickup aren't that much alike. This this is actually very similar in a lot of scenes in Fifty Two Pickup. Really, there are strange little side conversations between characters in Fifty Two Pickup while something else is going on. Right. And I thought when I, okay, I saw 52 pick up first and then I watched Manchurian Candidate after, right? Really? Okay. There's a scene with Roy Scheider taking pictures of Vanity and he's complaining about the quality of the pictures he's taking. That That's very much like the scene where where they're both suggesting moves for solitaire. You know? Yeah, it it's, is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we're in the middle of this and you're making comments. You're making unusual comments. Yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of other similarities, but we'll get into that when we get into 52 pick up. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I did note a, a, a handful of similarities between both films, That's and probably and probably the work of, of Frankenheimer for a lot of a lot of work that he does. I was touching, I had already watched the bulk of uh, of Manchurian Candidate when you said that. I had not yet watched Fifty Two Pickup, and I, again, you know, I mean, I've seen it a million times, but uh, but and and I, I see some, I see some of what you're talking about, but I, I kind of wish I had, I had had the time to go through them kind of both again and look for more similarities, and I didn't, I didn't unfortunately get the time to do. Well, that. I did, I did manage to pick up on them, and I'll, we'll share them when we get All right, to that. Good, good, good. Look so. Forward to it. Unfor- okay, so they decide to throw a party out of nowhere for Robert Jordan or something like that. Invite Josie, invite Raymond, get them together for some reason so that she can... I don't know if her plan is to have them get married and then... Or to to kind of curry favor. I know that she, she, she um, talks to the Senator Robert Jordan about her husband assuming the vice presidential nomination. And Jordan kind of... Se- well, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jordan kind of s- seals the deal when he says, I will do everything in my power to fight that. Right. And then that's it. So what happens is uh, he uh, Raymond is ordered to kill, and he doesn't know that he's doing this. And this it, it is very sad. This is very sad. It's terrible. He he doesn't know that he's been ordered to kill uh, the senator, and then he kills his own new wife. They got married, and it's yeah. And it's really sad too because like there's a scene, a, a, a small scene there between Leslie Parrish and Frank Sinatra where she says, "I know, I know he's tortured, but give me time with him and I can help him." And he says, "I'll give you 48 hours." And it seemed like it that that was too much time. It was well, you know, and I think I think it, that the character knew that he knew he knew it wasn't, it, it, he, but he he didn't have a choice. Like he had to do that just just because it was the right thing to do for for them. Uh, but but he all he knew he was playing with fire and and it was a it was a you know one of those things it's like you're doing it and you know that this is a bad idea like yeah. I, I, you know I that I, I I don't know I kind of identified with that I go through that all the time I do that all the time it's like I'm doing this but fuck, it's like this, this is stupid uh, I shouldn't be doing this should I like, this is this is <laughs> this is not a feel good movie it is really no. not a feel good movie at no. all no no although to to a certain extent like, like I mean you, you do kind of you, it. it Look, it's tough at the end. It ends. It ends on a, on a on a serious downer note, but you know you're kind of heartened by what Shaw does. You and, are because he's he 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 spends all the movie being a puppet of everybody else, yeah, including and he, and, including and, and Sinatra. There's a wonderful. It's scene unfortunate there. that he that he takes his own life, but but he 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 makes a stand. He's been deprogrammed. You don't know whether he's been fully deprogrammed or not, and 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 he takes this stand, uh, you know. And I, it was kind of, I, I, I was expecting him to take that stand. I was expecting him to to, to change his target and and you know go after. His... I would not. I, when I first saw it, I would that that ending kind of uh, came out. I didn't see that happening. I didn't see that happening at all. It felt very um, Oedipal. In a way, he's I killing. expected him to. I expected him actually. I didn't expect him to go after the uh, Iceland. I expected him to go after his mother and focus on his mother and shoot like, his mother to death there. And the yeah, street. like just keep shooting her until he's sure she's dead. Like, 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 um, but he he shot. He actually shot Iceland first, and then he hit the mother. Like, yes, like, he shot like, him right in the head. Yeah, actually. you never saw in movies. You never yeah. saw that in movies. And that, that was a uh, that was a um. It, I, but I I was sure that he wasn't going to shoot the the presidential candidate I, like i was i was i was sure yeah. that he was gonna he, he was gonna turn it around uh, but i was well, yeah, yeah he shot himself but then again what other what other what other recourse what was he gonna do yeah yeah after after josie and, and the senator are dead 
uh, Sinatra tracks down Shaw at a hotel room, and he brings a forced deck of nothing but Queen of Diamonds, and he lays each one out, tells him to play the solitaire, and Shaw tells him the whole plan, what the whole idea was. And Sinatra says, this is like one of the best Sinatra performances. He's like, the game's over. They have no more control over you and all yeah. this. And then, you know, you're going to call me as soon as you tell, as soon as they tell you what your plan is supposed to be and we'll be there. Right. He's got like, I've got a 500 men at my disposal. I can get a thousand if I need it. He, he waits and waits and waits and he doesn't get the call. And then he puts it together. Wait a minute. It's going to be something at the convention. Something's going to happen. He goes up there. He sees a tiny little window. Shaw is dressed up as a minister. He gets in. He's got his gun and everything. Yeah. And he's getting ready. And, and the trigger is, is these words that the vice presidential candidate says. Shaw, he, of course, as we said, he shoots. He shoots his stepfather right in the head and then shoots his mother. And then um, Sinatra comes in as he's holding the gun. He says, I didn't call you because I knew you couldn't do anything. I, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to get here. Yeah. And then he puts the gun to his own head and shoots himself. And it ends like that. With the, And he's wearing his Medal of Honor thing, too. He puts on his Medal yeah, of Honor. Yeah, um, Yeah. Uh, and then and then she kills himself. And at the end, um, Sinatra is reading um, reading off a list of heroes from the war. And then he, and he makes up a history for Brayman that what he did was probably the bravest thing he could do for his country. And he did it. And yeah. It just comes down to the fact that this is the first decision that Shaw makes in the movie. Right. Of his basically. own free will. Like, of his own yeah. free will. Yeah. Because everything is sort of designed to manipulate him. Even even Josie. Because Josie appears at the party and what is she wearing? Yeah. She's wearing an enormous queen of diamonds. Queen of diamonds, excuse me, yeah. And it's 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 it, all of this is, is meant to manipulate him and, and the and Sinatra and the military are manipulating him on some level too. So this is the first decision he makes in this entire movie, and it's to kill himself. And it, it is very much a downer of an ending. Yeah. Very much. Very much. Very much so. But staggering. Yeah. This is an important movie. It needs to be seen by everyone. If, they, if you want to – and also, I mean, like, there's so much going on here that is, like, about, you know, uh, politicians rigging systems and doing things. And, and, and this, is what, this is what politicians do. It's true. It, it is. Yeah, they they do rig stuff like this. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe these not evil to, to, conversations. To, yeah. They have to keep having these evil conversations, whether it's party officials or or or, or all these spies talking right. about all the terrible things they're going to do to to and and turning Raymond into this this yeah. effective killing machine who has no memory of what he does. The deep state Manchurian <laughs> candidate gets uh, two thumbs way up. Two from thumbs both of us. way up. Two slaps <laughs> up in a circle. You are now listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legank and David Lawler. All right, so uh, let's move on to, uh, shall we, uh, 52 pickup from, what, 1985? Uh, yeah, I think it's 80, 85, 86. I have to look that up. Now we have to look <laughs> at we watched Shit, movie. aren't we fucking prepared? Look at us. <laughs> all I did was write my notes. I didn't even write all the... What do we got? We have to have positive identification. We got to get some strong evidence. But there's no way in the world, once the story breaks, that you're going to keep it off the 6 o'clock news. Harry Mitchell, successful businessman, loving husband, a man who has now become the perfect target. Sit down, sport. Look, Mitch. You've seen some of this before. Stuff your girlfriend shot while your wife thought you were at a convention in Miami. Mitch, you're in very serious trouble. You pay us 105 grand a year for the rest of your life. No! They're ruthless. The cops find a body with no clothes on, the gun with your prints all over it. Desperate. He got an airtight case against me. It's my gun. I'm scared, Mitch. The only thing they didn't count on was Mitch having a plan of his own. I want to deal only with you. How much did the man say he was going to give you? I'm going to pay them 52,000. I know, they're plotting me out. He's a murderer. <laughs> On me, there's seven slick. On the button. I'll be there. Scheider, Anne Margaret, and Vanity in John Frankenheimer's suspense thriller 52 Pickup. 
from acclaimed novelist Elmore Leonard's gripping bestseller. Uh, 52 pickups, 86, yeah. 86? Yeah. Uh, directed by John Frankenheimer, of course, from a screenplay Based by Elmore. Based on an Elmore Leonard novel? From an Elmore Leonard novel with a screenplay by Elmore, Elmore Leonard and John Stepling. This is a fantastic screenplay, by the way. I mean, it is. Just... I, I would put it. I, I have to say that that, that it's uh, the best. Probably the the, the the one movie that captures Elmore Leonard novel the best is Get Shorty, and this is a close second. Get Shorty's okay, yeah, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I got. I I would think that this this one is better than Get Shorty, though. I, I think it's better because Get Shorty is more kind of a goofy comedy in a way. It is, but it really captures the book, and it captures uh, Elmore Leonard's weird sense of humor and and his and his writing of characters. And this this is a very close second. I mean, the Clarence Williams the Third character is a classic Elmore Leonard character, and it's played that way. They don't change it for the movie; they keep it the way it is in the book. He but is one serious scary motherfucker in this he movie. Is Clarence really Williams. fucking scary. Yes. But just looking also, at it, he doesn't even have to open his mouth and he scares the fuck out of me. I know, I know. He's just a scary son of a bitch. He's just like fucking intimidating in every way. And, and, and but like in the you know, the Elmore Leonard Elmore Leonard character like that, like it's it's a character type of character that he often writes that um that that is, you know, extremely intimidating, but also he's capable of some things that you don't think he is capable of. Like if he breaks into your house, you can convince him and talk to him and give him a drink and mm -hmm. like, and sit down and talk with him. Like, like, and like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that, that's just the way Elmore Leonard does stuff. And, and I'm glad that they didn't change some of that stuff. Uh, well, they like, did like, some of that in, um, I know it wasn't as good a movie, but stick had, uh, had, had this character bunny eyes. Remember, yeah, stick sucked. Yeah, but and like, he was played by Dar <laughs> Robinson, and he's like this albino dude, and he scared the yeah. fuck out of me watching him. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, that was it, look, I, I, and that's true, that's true. But the, like as a whole, this is a much better movie, like, just because. And from what I understand, this movie was was made before as a movie, as another yes, movie for Cannes. Is, they call, well, well, this is a true go on Globus uh, uh, type deal. They bought the rights to the book, and they're like, so. But we gonna only only make one movie out of the book. We're gonna we make two make movies out of the book. So if we make one called The Ambassador, it has nothing to do with the book, but we'll call it the book. Yes. <laughs> so you have okay. Roy Scheider is a is a um, an industrialist, and uh, he has a nice house, and he's married to Anne Margaret, and he swims, and he has a nice body. I was looking at. <laughs> Yes, he likes... I was looking at his wrinkly body. <laughs> oh no, he has a lovely body. Anyway, for a, for a man of his years, is wrinkly. Mm -hmm. The rest of him, yeah, no, he's he's in good shape for a man his age. For no no doubt about that. And he has he backs his cool car out of his garage somewhat Not recklessly, and I'm like, sit, but he's all right, you know. Like... <laughs> yeah, I think, he, and he's got like a Corvette with the top off or something, like a vintage That's Corvette. Jaguar. It's a Jaguar. Oh, Jaguar. Sorry. Uh, and, and like he's backing out of his garage and he's doing it really fast. I'm like, fucking put the brakes on. Would you back that thing up slowly? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. But it has a great 80s vibe and it's very similar in style, I would say, to, to Live and Die in L.A. With kind of like these panoramic views of yeah. Los Angeles and everything. Yeah, and it's a uh, you know, nice Gary Chang score, which mm -hmm. uh, Frankenheimer worked with him during that period. Also on Dead Bang, uh, for for uh, music that really really fits the the movie. I, I I'm 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 a fan of it. Very but the big score, but 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 very good. Right, and the big difference though is there's lots of like handheld camera uh, work in in the movie. A lot of it, yes. Following Roy around, following the bad guys around, following everybody around, really. And Margaret is running for Congress, so. Yeah. Uh, the but this thing really starts off right away. I mean, like he's got Roy Ray's having this affair on the side. He's got a slam piece, as my as my wife would call it, mm -hmm. um, uh, played by Kelly Preston. I guess who he picked up at a stripper slam joint or some kind of exotic piece. <laughs> slam piece. <laughs> yes, it's called a slam piece. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He has a spare apartment. He's cheating on Anne Margaret. He has a spare yeah. apartment for her. She's not there. The bad guys are, and they're all wearing like shit on their head, you know. But you know who the bad guys are, and when, especially when John Glover opens his mouth, you know who the hell that is. No, yeah. And they show him a videotape, and they and and apparently John Glover is like, it, it, this is a great character beat. There's a lot of good character beats, but John Glover is apparently very good with a camera yeah. and all this, and he and he's always making these comments that are hilarious in the movie. 
and he's critiquing his own filmmaking. Like, yeah, yeah. Talks about like, uh, so well, I was doing this with the camera. It's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that probably gave somebody the idea. Hey, let's put director's commentaries on movies. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we can hear them talking about their shots. It was uh, it all started sh- with fifty-two pickup. They show him this videotape with all the all this dirt on his relationship with Kelly Preston. While he's showing the video to Roy Scheider, he's lecturing him on his behavior. He's saying, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this. Why are you doing this? Why are you having an affair with this young lady? You, you shouldn't be doing rascal. that. Rascal. <laughs> <laughs> so he gives him a deal. He says, okay, I'll give you the tape for 105 grand. And um, Scheider's having a shitty day. Okay, now I had a question, though. Uh, I wonder who tipped off Glover as to Roy's activities. Was it that... Uh, Kelly Preston was kind of working there and just happened to spill that she was having an affair with this wealthy industrialist. It, it could have been her. It, it could have been her personally. It could have been Doreen. It could have been just could have been something Doreen, that they yeah. picked up. Like it could, could have been any of it. Like, well, that's why, you know, Scheider at the beginning, he's asked, is the girl in on this? And, and he's like, he's like, let's just say she did what she was told. Nah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. So Roy doesn't want to go to the cops because it would ruin his wife's political career and probably his own work. Uh, and Margaret being big on integrity drives Roy up the wall and he smokes a lot. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Uh, he does confess to Ann Margaret. Ann Margaret's pissed. He's sleeping he on the couch. He thinks that's the end of it. When he confesses to her, he thinks, that, like, all right, I don't have to pay these guys anymore. Yes. It's just going to go away. I confessed. I told my wife there's no more shit for you guys to do. Yeah, his lawyer even advised him, don't pay the ransom. So right. he doesn't. Instead, uh, they, they're supposed to meet up at uh, Dodger Stadium during a game. There's an actual game going on, by the way, between the Dodgers and the Mets. In the movie, and um, he gives him like a stack full of what looks like money. They open up the envelope. It says "bag your ass," which is yep. funny. Elmore Leonard style stuff, you know. And the blackmailers are just like oh, that. That is just complete. You know, Glover yeah. is like uh, incensed this by guy this. Fucking get it! <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, <laughs> what do you have to do? <laughs> so, and then we go to a scene where we reveal what John Glover does. Uh, he, uh, he he operates like a like this very huge broadcast video camera at these wild hooker parties, and I see vintage porn stars in that scene. Yeah, and Amber I, Lynn is in there. <laughs> Amber Lynn, Tom Byron, Herschel Savage, Ron Jeremy, who is probably one yeah. of the most famous, and actually Ron Jeremy supplied some of the video that they're using it because his name is in the credits twice, really? once for supplying video. Oh, and Sharon Mitchell too. So. Yeah. This is where Kelly Preston is, and she's there with her friend, who's Vanity. It, it gets really, really serious. They abduct Kelly Preston, and they have multiple cameras on her, and they kill her. With with Roy Scheider's gun. With Roy Scheider's gun, which is brilliant. This is brilliant, okay, because what happened before, there was a previous scene where John Glover's in their house. Yeah. And he kind of he, he fakes, he acts like he's an accountant. Yeah. Or something, which he is. He is actually an accountant. I mean, he does accounting. Yeah. And it's, it's probably one of the most uh, uh, gripping accounting scenes I've ever seen in a movie is John Clover doing. He's going Roy over Sh- the books. Yeah, he's going right. over Roy Scheider's books to find out just so, how much Roy Scheider has. When does your fiscal year end? <laughs> <laughs> it was so, an exciting scene, let me tell you, folks. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's like April. Um, so, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but what he was doing there was he was grabbing Roy Scheider's coat, he was grabbing Roy Scheider's gun, and this is really bad, and it's it's a great plan, actually. If you're a bad guy, you know, you can definitely get a, some advice from this movie. Yeah, you bet. Has anybody been here recently? Anybody we don't know? Yes. Yes, there was someone here. I, I came home one day, and, and there was a creep in the living room saying that he was from some accounting service. I told him to leave, and he did. He found the gun. He fucking came up here and found the gun. What gun? Would you please tell me what's going on? These guys. Three guys. They're blackmailing me. I wouldn't pay them. They had pictures of me and Cinny in a hotel. Yesterday, they showed me a videotape of Cindy strapped in a chair, being shot in the chest five times. And this accountant 
He was my guy to kill her. Why didn't you tell me about this fucking guy? Tell you what? Where the hell were you? How can I tell you anything? They got an airtight case against me. I, I don't pay. They put me away. And why not? I mean, I can't go to the police. It's my gun. I'm calling Iverson. Tell him I'm out of the race. Now, wait a minute. We got a couple of days. A couple of days. Give me that much time. Let's see what happens. So they kill Kelly Preston. It gets sick in a hurry. While Glover offers commentary on it. He's talking about the lighting and he's talking about the effect he wanted to achieve. Yeah. You know, killing this girl you know, with the camera and everything. So they use Roy's gun to kill and leave the incriminating evidence. The only problem for me in this scene is that they, none of them use gloves. With today's forensics, you could probably sweep for fibers, and you could That's probably today's find... today's forensics, not 1985 forensics. Even in 1985, they wouldn't even be looking at fingerprints or anything like that? They'd like, be looking at fingerprints, but then, you know... I they, see a lot wow. of bare hands, you know? Well, they, yeah, but they you know, they were using the uh, trigger on the gun with that string... Contract. They were using a string. But, yeah. But I would have I would have thrown in some rubber gloves, you know. Yeah, with the fibers and stuff. Today it wouldn't fly, but back then I don't know. I mean, you know, well, just all you have to do if you're doing it, if you, God forbid, you do a remake of Fifty Two Pickup or something like that, just put rubber gloves on. That's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, some rubber gloves. It's all good. Maybe a shower, maybe a shower bonnet or something to keep <laughs> hair from spraying. Yeah, yeah, rubber gloves. So now they want a hundred and five grand a year for life, no fucking around. And at the end of the scene in this room. There's a great moment here where Roy realizes he's been sitting in the exact spot where the girl died. Yeah, that is that is really good. That is a great scene. It's it's yeah. very disturbing. And and this is when I begin to note all the funny dialogue in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mentioned before that Roy Roy sets up a date with Vanity, criticizes the the, the quality of the pictures that he's taking of her. Yeah. Oh, and there's a sign on the door in the in the brothel that says "Ask about our layaway plan," which is just <laughs> fucking hilarious. I mean, Jesus Christ, there's so much great detail in here. Yeah, and 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 then later, uh, there's a confrontation scene between Glover and Scheider where he says, where Scheider says, "There's something about your face that makes me want to smack the shit out of you." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Roy, okay, now we go on the the offensive on yeah, Roy's Roy side. Yeah, Roy starts to turn the tables on them. Yes, and he starts, starts to turn them against each other. He's turning them against each other by fucking with their heads. You know, uh, you know, he wants he wants like he wants Clarence Williams the third who breaks into their house and he manages to get away. Well, the, he tells him about uh, what the percentages are and who's going to cut it up and who's getting the money and all this and that and how much the money actually is, which drives Clarence Williams crazy. And he and uh, Clarence Williams winds up killing one of their own, mm-hmm. uh, which is this guy. Uh, what, what's his name? Leo. Leo. Yeah. Yeah. The actor playing him is fantastic in the movie. He's terrific. He's, he's very terrific. sweaty. He's very nervous. He doesn't. I mean, he totally flips out. He's not like he's he's not like a. I don't know. You know. Okay. Leo is like I guess like like the audience's perspective of the bad guys. Clarence William. Williams is the scary part of it. Yeah. But John Glover is just the plain out flat psycho of the group. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And he's the real dangerous one. Actually, you know, Clarence Williams is like way less dangerous, even though you, you, if you saw the two of them on the street, you'd be like, like, you know, like Clarence Williams is the one that's going to kill you, but you got to watch out for John Glover. Like, um, yeah. And one, one of my favorite scenes is when, is when Leo invites Scheider to the bar and sits down with him. He's like, I will come with you to the cops and I will I will back you up. Right. And Scheider just basically tells him, he's like, he's like, so you say that they're going to kill me? He's like, well, you know what? I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what they do to you. And then I'll know if <laughs> yeah. they're serious. Like, That's <laughs> a great scene where he just keeps ordering, he keeps ordering drink after drink. <laughs> yeah. He's and like, he's like, ner- he's sweating and he's shaking. He's like, <laughs> it's, it's just like, it's, 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 it's incredible. It's a very well acted movie too. On top of it that, really it really is. I'd, I'd say it was a misfire for Golden Globus because everything works very well in the movie. It's, well, well, this this was this was when this was a, like Golden Globus. You know, for all their faults, they really did want. They had delusions of grandeur, and they really did want to, to bring in good directors like Frankenheimer and let them do their work. And you know, they did that a lot. 
if you you know if you watch the documentaries and stuff and look at their mm-hmm. look at their their uh, the things that they did, you know they they did that a fair amount. And this is one of those movies where like they brought in. Uh, you know, I mean, they look. They did the ambassador thing, so they had to, they had to do you know some shady shit. With... I'm guessing since we know more about Fifty Two Pickup than the ambassador, then the ambassador wasn't as good a movie. No, yeah, I, I you know what? I keep meaning to watch the ambassador. I think I downloaded it a while back, but I mean, really, who cares? It has nothing to do with any of it. Like, it, like it's basically a, a, a tangentially related story that has nothing to do with anything. It takes place in Israel, uh, and like, who cares? Like, right. like, I mean, it like I, I don't care. Like, um, you know, so they probably they they signed a contract with Elmore Leonard with a loophole in it so that they could fuck him over and make two movies out of it. And, and, like, right. Yeah. Like you know, like so that that but but so they did something shady like like you know you know that they did, um, but they also you know they brought in John Frankenheimer and made this movie which is pretty fucking awesome. You yes, know, it is. It is. And money was spent, and it looked and it looks it has a great look to it and everything. Yeah, um, cheap was that that car accident when he's on his way back from from finding out about Sin, Sinny getting killed, and like and like the car accident seems to take place in an alleyway, mm-hmm. and like and like it's sort of raining, and like you know the cops are there, but there are only like five cars in this traffic jam, and it's like man, come on, you guys probably could have done a little bit better than that, right? Like, like right. <laughs> but that was really the only thing that looked looked cheap in the movie like like you know. so and then we get to the famous accounting scene where roy is like i don't have any money i'm i'm in ha- i'm in hock to the irs i owe a shitload of money i don't have any money and he's like okay i'll go over your books so he goes over the books figures out he's got fifty two thousand dollars at least right so he'll give him that he abducts Ann margaret of course right and they make up an arrangement for a pickup in the meantime glover gets the drop on uh, clarence williams shoots him kills vanity and so now it's just Glover is going to pocket the money. Right. And uh, and Roy says, uh, I'll give you my car, too. You can have my car. Right. You can have the money in the car. Yeah. And uh, it's a great final scene at the end where. Uh, so long, sport. And he plays. For some reason, there's this tape playing in the car that says, this is the last 10 seconds of your life. <laughs> and then it plays this really loud song, and he can't get the doors open. And then, ah, and then blow, blow up. And then that's the end of the movie. Yeah. You got it? Yeah. Terrific. Come on, baby, let's go. You fix that shitty radio speaker? Yeah, it's fixed. If you're fixing to do anything to us, you better think twice. There's a lawyer sitting in my office looking at your fingerprints on my ledgers. If he doesn't hear from us within an hour, he'll know what to do with them. Well, this is it then. Adios, amigos. It's been fun. Beat it. Beat it! You got a fine bitch there. There's a lot of mileage on her, but she still cooks. So, uh, like I said, very. Uh, you know, I remember not not really liking the movie when it first came out because it came out on cable. I remember um, in 1986, right? And I I watched it. I, I this. You know, the thing about it, it, it what's interesting is that um, a lot of the techniques and a lot of the storytelling was was then used in many other movies uh, in the future. 
Right. So it was like, I mean, like you, you, you there, there's a lot here. Like for instance, Quentin Tarantino. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of Quentin Tarantino in this. I mean, like yeah, there it, is, yeah, a lot. I feel like he took whole scenes and just lifted them out of this movie and put he, them in other movies. Yeah. And then there's also the conversations that go on between people in Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction and things like that. Yeah, you know? right. it's like all very, it's all very similar. It is. It is. And I, um, I, I know that, like, I've become more fond of this movie. I think as I've gotten older, because, like, you know, when I was when I was like eighteen, nineteen years old, I enjoyed this movie, but I didn't I didn't understand the characters as well as I do now. As I get older and around the age more of these characters, uh, you know, I, I sort of understand their motivations a little bit differently and better than and I. And also, it's a serious popcorn movie. I mean, you it just, is. This is just a lot of fun. Uh, now I wanted to. I understand the the relationship of the the husband and wife a lot better than I did when I was nineteen. Yeah, know? that's true. That's true. I understand the way he feels about what he, you know, like I, I you know, like understand, you know, you can understand why he did what he did. You also, you also like when he when he's talking to his lawyer about, it, he's like, like look, he's like, I fucked everything up, and I'm not gonna fuck this up for my wife. I just, I, I would destroy her career. The only thing she ever built for herself, if I anybody ever found out about this, that right. cannot happen. Yes, you know, and like, like, and you get that, you know, like, you can, you understand, like, where he's coming from. Check out the big brain on Brad. You're a smart motherfucker. That's right. Like, yeah. he doesn't want his wife's life to be destroyed any more than it already has by shit that he did. You know. Uh, yes. Yes. I, and a story. It's yeah. so, there's actual character driven story here. Yeah. Which yeah. is again, I got a bitch about movies being made today. Oh, God, don't even get me started. <laughs> so I want to go into now the similarities I saw. Yeah, between I 50, I'm curious about that. 52 pickup and the Manchurian Candidate. And this might extend to the overall body of work by John Frankenheimer. All right. This is what I noticed, okay? The first one, the first point was whoever walks into a scene owns that scene and has command of that moment. Huh. This is one thing I noticed. It was, it was, it was similar. It was the same as in Manchurian Candidate. Frank Sinatra walks into a scene, he owns it. It doesn't matter that there are five people in that room, he owns that scene. Roy Scheider is the same in this, John Glover is the same in this. Right. There are usually people waiting around in a room, someone enters into that room and runs the scene. Okay. Now, there. okay, the second one was, there is a central protagonist who has an, an underlying problem weighing on its conscience. Mm-hmm. Roy Scheider and, and, and Lawrence Harvey. Both have problems that are already weighing on their conscience before the central action of the movie begins. Right. Shots are identical when characters hold guns. Have you, did you notice that when I, someone's holding a gun in the Manchurian Candidate and someone's holding a gun in 52 Pickup, they're almost identical the way they're staged. Really? No, yes. Not- their back is to the wall or their back is to a corner. They're holding it on people and they're, <laughs> you know, they're more often than not nervous. If only they put like and I, I have the the, the the shot where um, Clarence Williams kills Leo. Leo, I think we ought to get out of here right now. No, we're fine. Right, like the shot goes through and shoots the, his gay gay lover dude. Yeah, and then that window shatters, and he's yes. standing there with the gun, the, the silencer. That is one of the best shots ever. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's my fourth point. Really, there's always an obstruction when people are killed. There's always something in the way when people are being killed oh. in both movies. Interesting. Remember, the senator is holding a quart of milk. Right, and the bullet goes through the milk and into him. Right. Kelly Preston has a, yeah, a, Preston a, has a, a, a yeah, block the, of wood in front of her chest. Right. Uh, the window when Clarence Williams fires the gun. There's right. always something in the way that a bullet goes piercing through. Wow. It's very interesting. Uh, now, also, this you had to pick up on right away. Both movies are relentlessly bleak and depressing, but they have a heart to them. There's a heart to this to this very, very dark material. Right. The final I think point. Fifty-two pickup is less of a downer than. Uh, the, I think it's really depressing because you know, in the back of my head, I mean, you know, 
poor Kelly Preston and Vanity are dead. Yeah, and you think <laughs> about like like where where are they going to go from here? Like like you you wonder about when when they wake up when she 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 you know. And also, it's heavily up. implied. It's heavily implied that Anne Margaret is raped. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, and we don't see it, but we, it, it's very it's implied. Simple. Yeah, it is implied, and, and and you also know that he was busted for rape, and, and like so, so you know that yeah. that's that's yeah, his rap you know that's seat. that's on his table, whatever yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. going. And also, all of this is caused by Roy Scheider, just Roy that, Scheider. It wouldn't surprise me if that was part of the movie and it was cut out. Um, but yeah, no, you're you're right. And so, so what does what does tomorrow look like? And I, I always that, that's always that's always interesting. They, they, some they, you know like a couple of I think it was last year, 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. They came out with this movie. I don't know if I've mentioned it before, and I, I don't, I, I'll have to think of the, the name of it. But it's such an interesting concept. It's about what happens to the girl who survives the masked killer after all that shit happens. Right. Okay. Like, which is like, 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 you know, but, and it's like, and that, that's really the downer in 52 pickup is like, what happens tomorrow? What happens the next day? And does Anne Margaret still have her career? Does Roy yeah. still have his job? We don't know. Are they, he has no money. Yeah, uh, his money blew it, up in the it, car. It, it, you don't, and you don't know, you know, you don't find out, you know, right. which is, and that, that, that's a downer. Yeah. And, and the final point is that both movies hu use humor to cut through the tension. Right. There's, there's all this side conversation going on and it's stuff that comes out of nowhere it sort of smacks you in the face because you're not expecting it because it's very intense there's a lot of intense shit that happens in both movies and then yeah. there's these jokes and little gags that people are pulling it's it's very weird it's 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 right. it's, it's almost discomforting in that way yeah there you have the similarities between the two movies these are the things i noticed about yeah, it now that we've fucking depressed everybody <laughs> shit <laughs> and I think they're probably Frankenheimer's best movies out of everything. I've seen I've seen pretty much almost every one of his movies. I really like Seven Days in May. I think that's a fantastic movie. I love I liked. Uh, oh, let me see. Birdman of Alcatraz is great. Birdman uh, of Alcatraz. The Train. I, I I've been meaning to see it. I have it. I love Seconds. Um, I have not. Seconds seen is some a of great these weird movie. Sixties and seven. Black Sunday. I really enjoyed. Black Sunday was all right. Um, I love Dead Bang, but that's that's sort of a that, that, that I, I you know I, would I call that like a great movie? No, but I really love that movie. I have a soft spot for it, um, and that really brings us to the end of. Well, uh, I did. I also enjoyed Against the Wall. I thought that was a great movie too. Clar uh, Clarence Williams the third, I believe, was in that too. If was I'm he? not mistaken. Let me let me. Now, yeah, he was. He was. Before one hundred percent dead is another one that I I've been meaning to see. I have not yet seen. Um, I think I may have seen the beginning of it, and, and again, it was one of those ones that was uh, that, that suffered from uh, pan and scan hell. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that 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 one is supposed to be an interesting one. Well, it's got a great cast here: Richard Harris, Edmund O'Brien, Bradford Dillman from Dirty Harry. Connors, man, fucking branded. Chuck Connors. <laughs> what would you do if you're branded? <laughs> Larry Cohen. That's the Larry Cohen show. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he produced that. Uh, now, The Island of Dr. Moreau was a complete and utter fucking mess. It was just a mess, and there was nothing anyone could have done to make that movie anymore. No. That, it, was, it, was, it was unintentionally funny, too, on top That's of that. A disaster. I, 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 never, I never finished watching it, but yeah. I'm curious about this one that he removed his name from and made it Alan Smithy, this Riviera, the TV movie. Like, I got to see if I can get a copy of that. Riviera. Riviera, and there's like this weird cast in it. Now IMDb is getting lame on me here. Come on, man. What year did it come out? Uh, it looks like 1987. And he took his name off of it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's John Frankenheimer as Alan Smithy, starring Sergei Rusakov, Patrick Bauschau, and Elisa Davalos. Fucking A, man. Who the hell are these people? <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, well. A former spy named Kelly comes to the south of France to open a hotel for his post-spy career. He learns that three of his former colleagues have been betrayed and murdered, so he returns to the job he had left in order to search out the traitor. God, it sounds boring just reading a fucking <laughs> sun. I don't know. It sounds like Let's Get Harry. Yeah, I'd rather watch Let's Get Harry. <laughs> that was another Alan Smithy movie. I forgot that who was an Alan Smithy movie. I forget who did that. Like it was, uh, uh, I, I want to say it's it's uh, Robert Harmon, but it, it's not. It's one of those one of those 
80s. Let's get Harry was, oh, Stuart Rosenberg. Stuart Rosenberg. Okay, yeah, okay. Who was a Twilight Zone director who also directed Cool Hand Luke, I believe, and The Amityville Horror. Right. Did he? Do, yeah, he did. He did a bunch of the, the Laughing Policeman, The Drowning Pool, mm-hmm. Agam- I, The Pope of Greenwich Village. Was a, a, an inferior they entry. They took my in thumb, the Jolly. Now action hero series. Like, like it was un- unfortunate because the, the like the real the the Walter Matthau action hero series is really only confis- consists of two movies, which is the Taking of Pelham one two three, mm-hmm. and um and uh, Charlie Varick which are two amazing fucking movies. And, and like, I, I wish that he had done more of them because he made actually a really good action hero. I but, have an uh, actor friend named Robert Graham who's always talking about Charlie Varick. Really? It's constantly. Amazing, dude. That's one of my favorite movies. There's like two movies he always talks about. One is Charlie Varick. The other one is Vanishing Point. Really? Vanishing Point's good too, but I love Charlie Varick yeah. is the shit. Mm. <laughs> Charlie that's that's where the pair of pliers and a blowtorch line comes from, man. From oh, really? Pulp oh, Pulp. with the pair of pliers yeah, yeah. on them. It's yeah. going to work on the homies with yeah. a pair of pliers and a blowtorch. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? All right, uh, let's let's wrap this one up. Uh, the next one we're going to do, I guess, is Death Wish. Right? We're gonna we're gonna be. Oh, yeah. Talking about all the Death Wish movies, which I have not finished yet. I still have to finish. Uh, I'm going to be looking at these on m- multiple. Go. I'm going to have to go back and watch them again. I thought we did that show already. No, we did not. <laughs> we had to delay it, remember? <laughs> fuck, I thought we recorded it, though. Because oh, the, uh, the new one comes out in March. Oh, I got to go back and watch it again. It's been so long. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of fun, and we're going to talk about that, and we'll talk about the new production with Bruce Willis. And Vincent D'Onofrio and Dean Norris, an actor I've always uh, actually admired. Yeah, um, he was good in a few things. Mike Epps, Elizabeth Shue, directed by Eli Roth, edited, importantly edited, by Mark Goldblatt. How about that? I do like Mark Goldblatt. I wish he would go back to directing. We need to convince him. We should find him on, <laughs> we should find him on Facebook. I want Dead Heat Part 2. Dead Heat 2, the next Dead day. Dead Heat 2, Deader Heat. Yeah. <laughs> Death Day. Day yeah, death, day death Day Party. <laughs> Come on. Bring it. All right. Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, good Andrew. night. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to Extreme Cinema with Andrew Legang and David Baller. <laughs>